Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Tim Russell, Vice President, Community Engagement and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for WTTW and WFMT. And welcome to today's Chicago Tonight Black Voices, a WTTW News community conversation. WTTW is committed to producing and presenting trusted, best-in-class content fueled by distinctly Chicago sensibility. We have served as Chicago's window to the world, and our purpose is to enrich lives, engage communities, and inspire exploration. Essential to this purpose are our core values, in particular, diversity and equity. We celebrate differences, embrace inclusivity, and strive for equity. The stories we tell as well as the people in front of and behind the camera and microphone reflect the myriad of faces and voices of our region. Tonight, I am excited to introduce Angel Edu. Angel, Chicago Tonight, JCS Fund, DuPage, Fund of DuPage Foundation Arts Correspondent. Angel will moderate this evening's discussion, which will explore COVID's impact on the art scene in Chicago and what the future of it is. Lee support for Chicago Tonight Black Voices is provided by Fifth Third Bank. Additional support is provided by Gertrude Dane and James H. Wooten Jr. Allstate, the Chicago Community Trust, the Joseph and Bessie Feinberg Foundation, the Abe and Ida Cooper Foundation, Lloyd A. Fry Foundation, Eon Clinics, Nicholas Anton, Judy and John McCarter, and Haranda and Paul Donahue. Finally, Members and viewers like you make it possible for WTTW to bring provocative ideas to life, to tackle the issues that matter, and to expand our perspectives on the world in which we live. There is only one reason why this is possible, and that reason is, is you. Thank you for your support, and please welcome Angel. Thank you. Well, hello and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices, a WTTW news community conversation. Thank you so much for spending a part of your evening with us. As Tim mentioned, I'm Angel Ito. So the pandemic's impact has been wide reaching with no industry left untouched. And that includes Chicago's art community who has of course felt that impact with the phrase, first to close, last to open, being all too familiar, used to describe uh, theater and venue closures, canceled art festivals and exhibitions, and a slew of other creative in-person experiences. However, COVID-19 also served as a catalyst for public art, creating more visibility and autonomy for artists. And it's redefined how art can be used to engage and connect with communities. Now, tonight we're talking with artists, community leaders, and incubator space operators about the future of Chicago's art scene. Now you're all in listen only mode, but that doesn't mean you can't be a part of the conversation. We want to hear from you. So please chime in on the chat function with your questions and comments, and I'll be sure to share them with our panelists. Let's begin by introducing our guests and thanking them for taking time out of their busy schedules to, to chat with us. Uh, to start, we have Aaron Hartke, who is the first Deputy Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. Next, we have Dwight White, who is a multidisciplinary artist and creative consultant. We also have Bernard, Lewis, uh, Bernard Lloyd, my apologies, President of Build Bronzeville. We also have Tanika Lewis Johnson, who is co-founder of the Inglewood Arts Collective. We have John Veal, who is co-founder of Altspace Chicago. And finally, we have Alexi Young, founder of Art West Chicago in Garfield Park. Thank you guys so much for joining us. How are you all feeling about today's convo? <laughs> Excited. Very excited. So, excited. <laughs> so excited to have you all. You all contribute so much um, to the development of Chicago's art scene. And so it's really great to kind of hear about what the past year has been like for you all um, and hear about what you're going to be working on. So let's get right into it. We're going to start with the pandemic impact. Um, and before we even get into how creatives have reimagined art during COVID, I want to first just talk about what that experience was like. Uh, so Dwight, what can you tell me about what 
it was like to just kind of create during the past year uh, when we were stuck inside for so long? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think creating um, during the past year um, was a, a huge challenge, uh, I think, for me, mainly because I draw a lot of inspiration from my community, from people, from the outdoors, and from personal engagement. So um, creating inside my apartment or my studio wasn't ideal without having that inspiration to draw from. Um, so I, I struggled for a really long time, actually, probably for about six months um, until we kind of got back out onto the streets and we're talking about Black Lives Matter and a lot of other things. And it kind of inspired me all over again to start painting murals and to start getting back in the studio to bring some of those stories to life a little bit more authentically and truthfully. So yeah, I would say overall a struggle, but you know, we overcame. <laughs> yeah. And I think we saw a lot of your work all over the city. I'm sure folks are familiar. So it was definitely great to see you get back out there. Um, now, Tanika, looking at the Inglewood Arts Collective, it's a part of the city's Art 77 Recovery Plan Initiative that supports local artists throughout the city. I'm going to cue some photos now from the collective's work of stuff that you all have done um, throughout the past year, I want to ask, how would you say that artists and creatives have been impacted by the pandemic, um, especially thinking about rebooting the economy, what the burdens that have come with reopening the city, um, and just kind of thinking about where artists kind of fit into that picture? Yes, um, well, one of the most immediate things that uh, myself and my fellow Inglewood Arts Collective co-founders realized was um, how critical the arts were to the economic survival and entertainment and sustainability of a location. And because of that, we started to think about um, the lives of artists, you know, since we are not able to provide that outlet to the city, what was really happening to them. And so that's when we started an initiative to um, provide very micro grants of $150 uh, very early on in the pandemic to artists who were still um, avid about creating. But we realized how critical the arts were to the um, economic survival and enjoyment of a city and how vital it is beyond all of the ed educational attributes, but really what it adds to um, the lived experience of a location. And so we just focused our intention on helping support artists who were committed to doing their art during the pandemic. And Erin, I want to ask, what was it like uh, from, from the city's perspective, um, just in figuring out how to support local artists, but also keeping up bigger events and entities that uh, really make up, you know, Chicago's art scene that we see a lot downtown specifically? Well, I think it was it was a hard, uh, really hard, but I think a productive year for us trying to, you know, understand what was happening with our creative sector and and not just the creative sector, but the creative workforce, right? Artists and people that were uh, displaced and unemployed because of the pandemic. Um, and at the same time, we needed to be quick and nimble and um, responsive, right? And in terms of providing uh, critical support to the field. Um, I think we've been really fortunate um, that we've been able to be in deep partnership with you know, private philanthropy, other city agencies um, have really been committed and understood, right, what was at stake um, in terms of the necessity of culture uh, for all of the things that Tanika mentioned in terms of, you know, quality of life, economic development, community development, the things that art artists do and arts organizations bring to communities. So I think what we're seeing now because of it is a really unprecedented, you know, city investment uh, and an opportunity for us not only just to build back, but to uh, build back better. So um, it's all, I think, working for the good. And that's kind of a great segue leading me into my next question of just thinking about that uh, community impact and the community development that we saw. Um, so Bernard, I'd like to ask you, we saw Build Bronzeville do significant work throughout the pandemic. Uh, I know that you all had the Bronzeville Blues Collaborative. There was work that you all had done on the forum, a couple of murals. I know you all were yarn bombed recently. Um, and then you also have uh, the Black Wall Street, 
black wall street sculpture excuse me um and so we're going to queue up some of the photos of what that looks like of what you all had been doing uh the past year i apologize every time we cue the photos it messes up my screen but here we are okay so thinking about how were you all able to produce so much um in such a creative space throughout the pandemic including and thinking about how you were able to um, include local artists sure uh angel so we learned a long time ago that the more we can incorporate embrace art in our work the deep, more deeply we can engage our community and visitors to our community. So that's been a, a light motif in, in all of our work. The, the pandemic has challenged us, but, but it has shifted us to doing things that engage folks on the outside. So uh, the Brownsville Blues work was driven by a recognition that while the blues, urban blues was really created in Chicago and in Brownsville specifically, there's no place, ironically, there's no place in, uh, in Bronzeville today where you can actually listen to blues on an ongoing basis. So we partnered with a group of other folks to figure out how to bring the blues, how to reclaim the blues, to bring it back uh, to Bronzeville uh, on an outdoor basis, in this case, during Open House Chicago in the fall of, uh, of 2020. And that turned into a very productive set of engagements that uh, where folks were outside very comfortable, where we had music up and down uh, 43rd Street and, and, and so forth. So that was one key for us. A second key for us was utilizing the visual arts, uh, doubling down on the visual arts. So you mentioned the forum. Uh, the forum is an iconic structure. It's, you know, it contains Brunswick's oldest assembly hall. And we've been using it to celebrate the community. And, and, and this past year in particular, uh, we've doubled down on celebrating some Bronzeville icons, in this case, Margaret Burroughs and Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, and celebrating by asking one of our you know, leading community artists, Dorian Sylvain, and her team to craft these images with the community and to mount them on, on the forum. And so that, along with things that we, we're now doing with uh, Black Wall Street Journal, uh, has really helped us to employ these different arts to engage folks in, in a variety of different ways and bring them into the community development discussion. And it's so great to hear about um, a legacy, I mean, an arguably an, a legacy institution that has been around for so long to elevate the art in that community. But we have to, of course, think about other neighborhoods within the city. And I know, Alexi, you just started um, Art West Chicago during the pandemic. So can you tell us what it was like to start an entire organization during a pandemic um, and why you felt like it was the right time? Absolutely. Um, thank you. I think that's a great question. Um, so the irony is that when Art West was birthed in 2019, our very first engagement strategy was to create a tour, um, something that was pretty ambitious for the west side of Chicago, but we had learned so much from the south side. <laughs> so we were able to curate a really beautiful one day long um, tour that spanned from the MLK Exhibit Center to 345 Art Gallery to Legendary Art Gallery and, and several other um, uh, local arts and cultural spaces that we do have as assets on the west side of Chicago that a lot of people typically just drive past and never really had the opportunity to have that invitation inside of those spaces. So our job at that time was to invite people into the West Side to experience it differently. So people know us for our mission driven work, which is really rooted around um, rebranding the West Side through arts and culture. And so the pandemic happened <laughs> and we were not um, able to continue that tour in 2020. But an opportunity did come for us to open a location. And we thought that it would be a really great way to curate even very small, intimate opportunities to connect with artists, um, to position ourselves to be a, an anchor in the community as well, even during a very sensitive time. So we wanted to be able to have a location where we could provide mutual aid and provide workspace, private workspace for artists who maybe just needed to get out of their homes when it was safe to do so, to you know, be in a, an environment where they could do some creative experimenting there. Um, so it was very ambitious, but 
um, during the few months of the winter, we had to close because of the mandate. But thank goodness, um, because of so much support that had been flooded into the art sector, we were able to continue um, with our location and kept our doors open during a very critical time. And so we're happy to say we're still open and we're rocking and rolling now. So it's, it's an ambitious <laughs> decision, but we are so glad we were able to do so. Absolutely. I saw Dwight clapping over there. I mean, many success to you guys because it's so hard to, when I mean, we think about in general, all the businesses that have closed throughout the past two years and, and to think about how you've been able to successfully continue um, and to reintroduce uh, the West Side to the city. I think that's really incredible because I think a part of this conversation, we're focused on the South Side primarily. So thinking about what can we do to showcase more that's going on in other parts of the city. Um, and John, that kind of leads me to my next question. As we think about reimagining art and programming, I know that Altspace Chicago, you all were turning abandoned buildings into grocery stores. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting talking point as we think about how we're bringing together art and community, especially seeing that these spaces were on both the south and west sides of the city. Yeah, so um, I work in Austin. I'm from Austin, Chicago, which is on the west side. It's the largest community in Chicago ge uh, geographically. And mm -hmm. there are 5,000 abandoned spaces in Austin. And so at first we started in 2019, just reimagining what these spaces could be by kind of having these public photo shoots in these beautiful spots in Austin, because what Austin is, is families. And we wanted to honor our families. We wanted to honor our neighbors and uplift their stories so that when you walk past an abandoned building, you'd see those stories, you'd see your neighbors, you'd see that love and feel that love. But when the pandemic hit, um, a lot of people were joking about toilet paper and how hard it was to find, or, or you gotta wait in line at Target just to get one but a lot of my neighbors couldn't get one because there are no grocery stores because I can walk around in my community and, and there is, it really is a food apartheid. And so we started looking at the building, like we can create a mural here and that mural is going to be a, a beautiful and it's gonna honor our neighbors. But is there something that art can do a, a, a little bit more? Can we push this medium forward just a little bit more? And so we started to think about how can we give away food? And we, we did that first. We, we did a program called Faith in Action. We gave away 650 care packages, you know, women products and toilet paper and food. But we realized that it just perpetuated a system of de dependency. And we didn't want that. We wanted to kind of encourage neighbors to share with neighbors. And so we just decided to kind of take this abandoned space and together invite our neighbors out and we created, we imagined what it could be. I think it's very well said. I know we talked about before just thinking about reimagining what does art mean for communities and spaces and thinking about how you can stretch that medium um, to go beyond maybe, like we said, a mural or an exhibit in an art museum. Uh, I want to ask Dwight, and as we think about reimagining art um, in the city. I know that you had something that I can feel, something I can feel, I'm sorry. Um, that was a five day event that was around Juneteenth or in celebration of Juneteenth and thinking about how you introduce the community to artists, whether it be through classes or seeing artists work firsthand. Can you tell us a little bit about that while we check out some photos? Yeah, um, something I can feel. Um, I know I mentioned kind of during the pandemic, what it looked like to pivot, what it looked like to not be inspired. Um, but something that did inspire me was being able to potentially craft experiences or curate experiences for the black community. And so as I was kind of brainstorming throughout the pandemic it was like, you know, what is an opportunity? What is the black community missing right now? What's something that we're struggling with? Um, and not only was there a lack of arts, but I also felt like there was a lack of peace. Um, there was kind of a lack of comfort almost. And so what I did was something I could feel was really pull together a combination of fine art, digital art, um, even brought in um, yoga led by black men from the healing, um, which was obviously it's a contrast, right? Like you think yoga, a lot of times people immediately are thinking, okay, women, we're stretching, but 
this was an opportunity to highlight black men, put them in the forefront of this um, type of yoga experience. That was incredible. Had um, over 20 black owned brands involved, which uh, I don't know, when I think back on it, it was probably like one of the highlights of my life, being able to kind of just put, you know, black people at the forefront, celebrate them across art, community, culture. Um, so I think something I can feel, like I said, it was all around, being able to celebrate the arts, get people in a, in a space where they could be peace at peace and um, ultimately just try and engage the community as much as possible for that seven days we were open. Absolutely. And I think I just personally thought that it was cool to see a different kind of take on what an exhibition or an um, experiential learning, what that looks like, because I think that We've traditionally just seen it be like one thing or the other thing, but never like a slew of opportunities over the course of several days. And it wasn't really like a festival. So I thought that it was just kind of a unique blend of really bringing the community together um, to get that firsthand experience with artists. Um, but thinking about what that looks like on a bigger scale, Aaron, can you talk a little bit about how the city is thinking about reimagining um, art in the city and different uh, spaces? Yeah, well, I think, you know, because of the pandemic, I mean, uh, DCASE is a unique uh, local arts agency in that we, you know, provide cultural resources to the community in terms of grants and public art um, and professional development services, but we also are uh, a pretty large uh, event producing uh, agency. So we produce things like Taste of Chicago and Blues Fest and Jazz I Fest and Sorry, I know you all had a couple of markets that we have pictures of, but I want to make sure that we see if things that you Yeah, all and we, yes, we also run uh, the city markets program. So we're, we're out in neighborhoods. Um, but one of the things I think that was beneficial, if, there, if you can say that right about the pandemic, is that it gave us an opportunity to kind of rethink um, our program uh, portfolio and the scale and um, the reason and, um, you know, the kind of uh, spirit behind those events, right? And so uh, this year, uh, in, in large part due to some, you know, budgetary constraints, our budget was cut by 50% because in 2020, uh, because of the uh, pandemic and were largely funded by uh, tourism dollars. Um, so some of it was necess necessitated by just a lack of budget, but also just because it was the right thing to do. So we've been hanging out uh, in neighborhoods. We've taken like Taste of Chicago on the on the road. Uh, we were in Pullman, um, Austin. We were in West Inglewood uh, last weekend, which was totally lit. It was really fun. <laughs> um, it was raining, but people were out there uh, with us. And and next weekend, uh, we have a house city uh, event that's going on on the southeast side in partnership with Sky Art. Um, and it just has felt, it's been emotional for us actually, just, you know, um, having the chance to be back with people, but also the smaller kind of scale event puts you um, in closer contact, right? With the people that you're um, doing the work for and you get to, you know, kind of interact with them on a way that sometimes the large scale event production doesn't allow you to. And uh, just being in conversation with folks who are, you know, so energized, you know, with the opportunity to be back in fellowship with their, you know, fellow community members and uh, just, you know, trying to have a good time and listen to some music. It's been really, really beautiful. And we've been really grateful to have the resources to be able to do that. Absolutely. And I want to, as we think about what these these programs look like. Um, Alexi, I want to ask, especially as a new business owner, what you think about um, funding for these communities and organizations that primarily, or DCASE is a great example of one of those organizations that does that. But do you think that this funding is something that will continue? Uh, and what do you see that looking like? Like, do you have a timeline? Can you talk a little bit about the impact that that funding provides, um, especially as a new business owner? Well, I do believe that the funding will continue and that it will increase and grow over time because I, I, I truly believe that um, the pandemic has allowed us to see even more so than before that the arts, the arts and culture community um, it's not just an accessory to the city, but an asset. 
um, it really does shape the tone of the lived experience of people all over the city and often is the reason why people are coming to, you know, enjoy Chicago and enjoy um, connecting with other artists and the creative workforce here. And as we know, like there is nothing that you can see in this world that has not been touched by an artist or a designer, like nothing would, would exist. Um, and I think that that was a new reality for, you know, a lot of people. So um, I'm happy to hear that DK is still able to push forward the work that they've been doing for so many years, but to know that the necessity is definitely still there. Um, but I also believe that entrepreneurs um, uh, is a whole new sector of people who will start to use um, their creative, their creative experiences to learn how to build businesses and that's really like my story. I started out um, just painting, then it turned into sip and paint classes. And now, you know, um, because North Lawndale was such a, a loving community that I was able to groom um, from just doing vending events to now having a space of my own to share with other artists. And even in that, um, we're seeing a lot of artists who are able to not just lean on each other, but also lean on um, many organizations that are also like pitching in. So what we're seeing is just like this melting pot of support. It's like, whether it's financial or emotional, like we all are starting to care about the whole spirit of the city and the spirit of people who are doing the work. Um, so I'm really excited about being in the position that we're in now um, and have been able to receive funding, especially in the most critical moments that we didn't even anticipate. So um, because of organizations like DKs and, and, and individuals like Tony who mentioned like those micro grants, all of that matters. Being able to just call, you know, someone who's on the South side, knowing that we're all a part of the same families across the city and say, hey, you know, um, I just want to talk. I just want to get, you know, some advice, some inspiration and to know that we all have access to each other like that. I think that's really beautiful. And I, Alexa, you mentioned something about uh, how we saw an increase in funding over the past year uh, that was, yes, due to COVID, but we could also argue that it was due to kind of the uprise in activism and social justice that we saw in our streets, whether it had been protesting or um, in different art mediums, like we saw so many murals. I know like Dwight was very involved in that. Um, and so that kind of has me thinking about the next topic that we're gonna move to, which is social justice and community impact. Um, and I would like to ask all of you how exactly you think that the past year and the uprise that we've seen um, post George Floyd during the pandemic has affected uh, each of us in the organizations that we're working with. And Tanika, I would like to start with you. Um, thank you for um, that question because um, more than artists creating products, um, we're an amazing source of just creative thinking. And I think the pandemic has revealed to the rest of the world the way in which art has always been a part of social justice movements, even if it's just documenting, even if it's just the performative nature of protests, that's still an art form. People moving in the streets, people creating signs. Art has always been a part of these very significant transformative moments. And I think we all came together to see the important role that arts can play into helping people expand their thinking. It's not just creating an art piece or creating experiences. It is contributing to helping people expand their way of thinking in very critical times. And also being a comfort in those critical times. Immediately when the pandemic happened, what did we do? We read, we listened to music, we tuned into, you know, concerts. So um, I, I really appreciate the fact that people elevated their value of the arts contributing to how the world can see things differently. And of course that leads to social justice. Um, you have artists who want to in, be intentional about creating work 
that helps people understand the larger systemic issues. But then you also have other ways in which artists, you know, help people see these experiences or these issues differently. And so the pandemic really solidified that. And um, I'm just honored to be a part of this collective of, of artists in this specific city who really took that moment and, and held to it to advance what people really truly view the arts as. It's not just art alone, it is transformative thinking. We are creatives in how we imagine solutions and help people um, reach those solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, today, so yesterday was the birthday of Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was the birthday of Emmett Till. So I'm thinking about this. We teach on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We collaborate with Chicago Park District Trace Program. And today we went to see the Obama portraits at the Art Institute. And so yesterday was the birthday of Emmett Till, right? Where this, this boy was killed. He was murdered for nothing, for the color of his skin and for being at a place and his mother had the strength to let the world see what her baby had looked like. And that had sparked a moment that Martin Luther King would later use to present a dream. Now, today, I'm showing my students another symbol on the walls of the Art Institute, but we don't own that institute, do we? We have to bus to that Institute. So I think that for Alt Space Chicago, what we're thinking about is that, uh, yo, Aaron, Alexi needs $2 million because what she's doing is providing a safe space in a dark setting where financial instability has made crime more relevant, where lives are at stake. Tanika Lewis Johnson, Tanika Johnson needs $5 million to continue doing her, her project for Folded Map because Folded Map is talking about the story of housing and where people live and how their skin affects where they have lived in this city. So as much as we can kind of say, man, 2020, we rallied together. Even when they, they were talking about, there was a city ordinance talking about, oh, we, we're gonna charge museums, right? And we all rallied together and said, well, no, the, the arts, we, we provide a lot to the city. You shouldn't charge us for being museums or for house museums, that this should be public. And we were able to rally together and fight and win that battle. Now comes the battle of accountability. Now comes the battle of ownership because the spectacle can only go is what we do. We make images. We, we, we lie to people, to be honest with you. Like when you look at a Van Gogh painting, you're not really looking at a sunflower. You're looking at some strokes of pigment that represent something else, represent something more. And each one of us on this panel represents something more. And so now it's about using our tools to hold this city accountable. Like, hey, uh, I don't need uh, a couple thousand dollars guys to you know make an art program to teach about photography i need a couple thousand dollars to give some cameras to kids and teach about why photography is important we need to talk about ownership of a print lab on the west side of chicago we need to talk about how boxville in, on the south side of chicago can be bigger how can we get some more boxes out that bad boy so i think we're we're, we're, we're thinking about accountability we're thinking about systems of sustainability going into 2021 Hard to follow, John, but who would like to go next? <laughs> I was just gonna say that I think I think John's right in terms of like what we need is scaled, scaled investment in artists and creativity. Um, I think one of the things that I'm proudest that we were able to do over the course of the pandemic is that we launched an, a new program, which was like an artist response program where we 
gave out really sizable grants of a hundred thousand dollars to artists. It wasn't five million, but it was it was a, you know a sizable uh, investment, right? In in artist work that we you know felt was at scale, dealing with you know discriminatory housing pra uh, practices. Tanika was was one of the recipients of that grant. You know gentrification issues, native futures, um, you know all of that stuff, incarceration. Um, you know, artists, given the tools and the resources, can affect substantial, right, change within our communities, and you see evidence, right, of that here on this this panel. So I think it's important that we um, that we not just talk the talk, and that we back that up with real investment, right? That's going to actually uh, really make that change visible in our communities and that that requires resources but the resources are there we just need to um direct them in the right way and, and i think we absolutely need scaled investment in the arts but then below that uh, we need scaled investment in community much more broadly uh, we're nowhere close to having the, the level of investment that's needed to address the disinvestment that's happened for decades happened for 100 years uh, in on the west side of Chicago, on the south south side of Chicago, and unless we have that investment, and together with that investment, have ownership. This is not about investment of others coming in. We need to channel invest real investment at at, at levels that 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 uh, recognize these decades of disinvestment. But we need to do it in a way that it provides ownership, so that the Alexis of the world, the, the Tonicas of the world, so that, so that those folks have ownership. Uh, the Johnsons will have ownership of the process so that the community has ownership of the process. That's the only way that this will turn into a sustainable revitalization of communities rather than a you know one here, one there showpiece of a, of a project. And not to cut anyone off because I know I want to hear from everyone, but a great example of that that we're seeing is like house museums, right? If we look at um, Muddy Waters home and we look at the DuSable Museum that started in the home of Margaret Burroughs. Um, I think that those are just really strong examples of what that ownership could look like on a smaller scale as we figure out how we can um, build that. But Alexi, Dwight, I'd love to hear from you all as well. Well, what I love that you mentioned is um, there's this theme um, around ownership, and that was one of the key um, reasons why we wanted to move forward to launch a space, um, not so that Art West could have a space, but one of the things that we've seen for a lot of entrepreneurs, we don't just serve um, artists uh, or visual artists. I mean, although we do run the space um, primarily as a gallery by day, but we do understand that creating a safe space, um, especially as we reconsider how to impact um, population retention. We talk about North Lawndale and the West Side losing its black population, especially because we're combating violence and even the perpetuation of um, violence through vicarious stories through the news or the media. Um, where are the places for people who are, you know, homeowners? Where do they go when they just want to have a good time? You know, where where are the safe spaces for those cultural amenities to be in close proximity to where people live, work, and potentially want to play, right? Um, and so as we were thinking about entrepreneurs. Um, being a, 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 the fibers of our communities, you know, um, whether it's just like somebody s selling those snowballs on the corner or, you know, your mom who used to do hair in the basement, like these individuals have taught us, like, this is what it is to be a part of a community, a part of a village. And so when you have a space, you share that space. When you have ownership, you can provide access. So one of the things that we often see is institutions don't always necessarily have that open door policy, right? Whereas when you are the owner of a space, then you absolutely have, you know, the autonomy to say, hey, you know, I know that this entrepreneur can only afford but so much for rental. So let's work something out. So, um, for us, we share our space with many individuals and not just artists, but they are, as Tony mentioned, they're creative thinkers, they're creatives. And 
They want to provide solutions to the people that they love, um, the people that they care for in the community, and they want to build their businesses. They want to grow. Um, and it's not even a personal choice. Sometimes we are stepping into these roles by force. Um, if you don't see it happening, then it's our responsibility to create it. So our membership is opened to um, individuals who need uh, access to space on a regular basis and they can afford whatever it is that they can afford and we help them scale their business. Um, so that's the differentiation with Art West among some of the most amazing spaces that we love and enjoy on the West Side. Um, one thing that we can definitely say is that ownership has allowed us to be open to um, the entrepreneurs that you know will help us continue to drive this mission forward. Dwight, you're up. Yeah, and I, um, to add to that, I mean, I think ownership is a piece that I'm gonna start um, what I have to say on is because, you know, for me personally, um, I was previously in a very corporate setting, right? Um, I spent a lot, most of my time trying to help others understand why I should have, why I'm trying to utilize my voice in a certain way, why I wanna talk to consumers in a specific way, why I want my communities messaging to look a certain way, because um, I was that one black voice in a very white space um, for, for a very long time. And so as an artist, it was one way for me to start to control the narrative, start to control the message that I wanted to share with my community more broadly. Um, and that was kind of what led me to becoming an artist full time just a year and a half ago, right? Start of the pandemic. Um, and it was really because I wanted to do exactly what um, Tony was saying around documenting history. I wanted my art to record history. I wanted to help shape the culture. I wanted to, you know, cultivate <laughs> my imagination and the imagination of others, the youth, right? Um, that was something I wasn't able to do in previous spaces that I occupied. Um, so really to have an impact and to have that be a part of that social transformation and be a part of that narrative of Black Lives Matter um, and be able to be a visual representation of that. Um, it was huge and it's it impactful. So I feel like, you know, art, when it comes to social justice, um, social awareness, it's all around it's generating awareness. People connect to art in a very different way than they may con connect to my voice, right? And I recognize that. And so I utilize different uh, mediums, <laughs> whether it's me, um, you know, painting, whether I'm creating sculpture, whether I'm um, creating music, which is something that is, makes me extremely uncomfortable, but it feels good in private, right? All these things are ways of me taking action um, and recognizing that it's not just my two feet and it's not just my voice out on the street that's going to do it, right? It's going to be me connecting with youth, making children's books, making new murals in the West Side community, South Side community, wherever community I need to have an impact in, right? And so I don't think our it's not necessarily always expected to make this huge change. Um, but I think like many people pointed out today, the world goes nowhere without art. Messages are not digested without art. You can't change perceptions without art. Um, so really this, this conversation about social justice and art is really just challenging. It's just challenging people in the ways they perceive things. And so, um, I don't know. That's why I, I feel blessed every day to be in the position I'm in to have the hands of a creator to be able to put my mark out on the city, out on the streets, and for people to connect with it, for members of our society to feel inspired by it, and ultimately continue to educate people. So, yeah, Dwight, I agree. I think that is a really great point when we think about the educational component that art provides. Um, that made me, when everyone was talking, it made me think of this quote by Nina Simone, and I believe it is, an artist's duty is to reflect the times, or I might have messed that up a little bit, but I think that that just really speaks to what this, this conversation has just been and as we think about social justice and community impact, how we are really just, or you all have just been responding to what has been going on, whether it be protest 
or not. Um, and I think it's it's been really great to see the work that everyone has been doing, especially like with Aaron, when we think about your positionality in a city organization and bringing that awareness throughout the city um, is, is really powerful. And we think about Alexi and John and the impact that you all have on the West side. I mean, just, keeping folks there, but also bringing folks there. Um, and then of course, Tanika with your work with the Folded Map Project, which we've worked together on, or we've talked about, um, and just thinking about how you're using art to educate the public on the disparities that go on within the different neighborhoods in Chicago, as we really understand the North and West side and how we're able, how you were able to use photography to show that and to have the conversations with your, um, your map twins. And so just kind of thinking about all of the different avenues that you all have been working in. Um, it's just, it's really great to see. And this has been a very fruitful conversation. Um, thinking about the future of art in the city, I wonder if anyone has anything else that they would like to add that they haven't been able to talk about today? Well, first, I, I wanted to just point out this thread that that I, I find very inspirational in this discussion, which is this notion of, of the a tremendous important importance of creating shared spaces. Because I think each one of us is doing, each one of our teams is doing that in a different way, whether it's a grocery, whether it's a gallery, whether it's an incubator, whether it's public murals or the, 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 the folded map project, we are creating shared spaces in communities that have lost all these shared spaces because the investment has gone out of them. So I think in, in all of these mechanisms, we're, we're creating a sense of shared uh, safe places that bring people together, that create synergy between folks that provide feedback, provide access to, to resources. Uh, I think that's that's incredibly important. And then thinking about how we how we move that forward, how we how we join some of these things, what the next iteration uh, is, I think is is incredibly important. But I just want to applaud everyone for all of the the wonderful work in in in, in doing this. Um, thank you for that, Bernard. I just want to add that the Inglewood Arts Collective, thanks to funding from DCase, we are. Um, trying to help encourage the next generation of artists to share their voice and their talents with the world um, through our United Steel campaign. Um, we are awarding 10 South Side artists um, with $3,500 to kind of share their light with the world, um, you know, accessibility to resources is, or the inaccessibility to resources is a byproduct of disinvestment and systemic racism. And we are proud to be a bridge to connect those younger artists to resources that they might not have known about. So they can go to inglewoodartscollective.org to apply. The application ends August 6th, but uh, we are looking forward to receiving those applications and not only awarding 10 artists, but also being a mentor to those young artists to help them understand how their art and their perception of the world can truly inspire others. So in addition to the other applicants who may not get selected, they will still be kind of within our, our arms so that we will guide um, with, with all of their visions. So the United Steel campaign is going on and all artists can go apply to inglewoodartscollective.org.com. I'm so sorry, Jesus. <laughs> I want to add, I've been collecting the chat here. It looks like someone named Maurice Reed gave Alt Space a shout out. So Maurice, that's the plug. That's the OG. Um, um, and we have I, another, I wanted to ask, we have a question. Someone else from the chat asked, what advice you all would give to younger artists? So for whoever would like to answer that, feel free. John, it looked like you have something to say. Maybe you could just jump in. I, I got announcements. I'll wait on that one. Okay, sorry. Believe exactly. in yourself. There Believe it is. in yourself. Boom. Do not let the results of all of the oppressive systems make you think differently about the genius within you. Believe in yourself and you will connect with others that will support you, all of us here on the panel, but do not give up on what you are passionate about. It will be transformative and connect you to others that share your vision. Believe in yourself. My advice is that um, 
Well, I'd, I'd say two things. The first is um, the lifestyle that you truly desire is right on the other side of that crazy creative idea. So <laughs> unpack it. Unpack it. <laughs> and then my other piece of advice is the most favorable outcome is what you will always manifest. So if you get a rejection, if you get a no, if you get a not now, that can also still very much be the most favorable outcome in that specific situation. So don't be afraid to keep moving forward. I think what Alexi said, right on the other side of that crazy idea, I mean, getting there is extremely uncomfortable too, right? So I, what I always tell my young people is just getting comfortable being uncomfortable. I think um, <laughs> you definitely, like that crazy idea, it takes a lot of heart, right, to, to overcome that. To get, to get over to the other side. So definitely lean into your mentors, lean into panels like this. And yeah, know that your community got your back um, when you are ready to, to jump into that uncomfortable idea or different level of creativity, so. I, I, I would just say that uh, most people trade their human capital, which is their time and their skills for economic capital, which is liquid, you know, money or, you know, land or stocks, whatever that be. But there are these other forms of capital that are underutilized. And I would say to leverage those. There's the institutional capital, right? So it's the cachet that you might have with your high school or all these other things. And then there's also uh, your social capital, which is everyone you know, everyone you know. And so I would, I, would, I, would, I would ask myself the question of like, okay, if most people are leveraging their human capital for economic capital, how can I leverage my institutional capital for economic capital? How can I leverage my economic capital for social capital? And so play with that. I think that's a great point. And I don't know who just added this in the chat, but someone added to all the parents and guardians out there to believe in your children. Um, is there anything that anyone would like to add on that? I mean, that's put anyone on the spot. I know a couple of people here have kids, but just thinking about what that means to uplifting your kids in non-traditional spaces, right? Because art often is not seen as tangible or really feasible to what a nine to five looks like. Your child's arts education is not necessarily about them being an artist. Like I had a, you know, I have a creative profession, but I, you know, was a musician. I didn't ultimately end up being a musician or an artist, but it is a, a gateway and a window to being able to see the world in a completely different way and uh, investing in yourself and your confidence. So um, just saying that arts education has broad applicability, you know, even if your kids don't become artists. So don't discount it. It's um, invaluable. I would encourage parents to, if you find that your children are interested in certain things, or if you see some natural abilities, say for instance, they're really good at creating TikToks or videos, like perhaps, you know, placing them in um, spaces where they may have the opportunity to learn more about video production or film art, or, you know, maybe if you don't have access to those programs per se, we got our phones. The internet is such a great resource. Videos, you go to YouTube, you can literally hear from Spike Lee himself speaking, you know, about um, his process. I would just say, try to expose our youth to as many professions as, as you can see um, and widen that scope for young people because they can only um, aspire to what it is that they know. And if they don't know about certain positions and professions, then how can they aspire to those places? So um, I would say, you know, ask them questions, find out what they're passionate about and try to expose them to what that might look like as an adult or what that might look like as a profession. Is there anything else anyone would like to add regarding that question? Just to build off of what um, my sis Lexi said, um, passion fuels purpose. Mm -hmm. And to help your children, the young people in your lives, if you're not um, a biological parent, um, just letting them know that there is value in discovering what your passion is. 
because your passion ultimately dictates decisions that you make in life, important decisions that you make in life. So there is extreme value in investing in yourself to figure out what you're passionate about because it is the portal that kind of carries you into uh, wherever it is you want to go, whether that's meeting other people, a career path, a life decision. Um, it truly is important to help facilitate the youth's discovery of their own passion. Um, because within that, you learn so much about yourself and the world. And when you learn so much about yourself and the world, you want to help it. You empathize with it. So passion fuels purpose. Very well said, Tanika. Um, is there anything else anyone would like to add? Or No, okay. Looking at the future of art in the city, Erin, I would like to start with you when thinking about what DK's uh, programs folks can look out for in the coming months as we get ready for the cold weather. Uh -huh. Well, perfect, perfect timing. One of the things that we're doing coming out of the pandemic is that the city has initiated the first uh, citywide planning process since 1966. Uh, this is how, yes. Wow. For real. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this is how, this is how the city uh, establishes priorities, uh, including funding priorities uh, for decades. Um, and um, we're fortunate that we've uh, gotten artists integrated into this process and we're winning, uh, working with Honeypot Performance, which is another uh, uh, collective as part of this, this circle, uh, Afro-feminist uh, collective. And just saying that alone, uh, you know that we are in a vastly different space than we uh, were in 1966. Uh, but we have artists working uh, at all phases of uh, the plan from housing and neighborhoods to economic development, to environmental justice, to arts and culture, to public safety and lifelong learning. And uh, the artists are kicking off their in-person engagements um, this week. Um, so I'm encouraging everybody to artists and creatives to not just jump in the arts and culture space, but to really infiltrate the entire planning process because it is important that we see um, uh, resources for artists reflected in, in all aspects of the plan. Um, and this will be an opportunity for us to go grow resources in, in all uh, aspects and walks of life for arts and culture and for our city. So uh, we will Chicago, please uh, check it out. Perfect, I'm glad you liked that plug because I know folks are gonna be asking. Um, John, I know you were ready to kind of plug some things that you all are working on too. Yes, okay, so I'm so excited and I don't wanna like waste anyone's time and so I'm gonna work really, really hard guys to like condense into two things. And so um, we're, we're in the alt space studio right now. We've been here since March and we've been able to support women this past year on our staff, which has been really, really phenomenal. We had an artist in residence, Abire Agbuncha. Uh, we had a social media marketing manager. She's a teen, her name is Aiden, but she did a fantastic job managing our TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of jazz. And so did Kristen James. And I, you know, so part of it is just like us continuing to support artists and like, how can, like, how can we work together? Cause sometimes art has to be utilitarian, but sometimes art is just beautiful and that's worth it. And so we want to invest in those artists who want to just work and do art. But at the same time, those who have more administrative skills. And then I know I said I wouldn't, but I, I, I am. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm, I'm taking us on a little tour. So I'm, 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 I'm so proud of these. Like, you have no idea. This is a dream of ours. Uh, so a little story about those two. So we started a program in 2019 called Sunday Service. And you know, what we did, we, we looked through the police records. My, my partner, my business partner, Jordan Campbell, had found that Sunday is the highest uh, likelihood for gun violence on the west side of Chicago. And so with that being said, we just wanted to be a light to our community and at the same time clean up the visible trash because it's one of the first signifiers of poverty, of like bad spaces, right? And how we treat spaces is how we treat people, right? And so we would clean every Sunday, you know, and, and we would do some project stamps on abandoned buildings. But what we would notice that like, after it got dirty, you know, like after we would clean, uh, two days later, it would get dirty again. And what we discovered is that if, okay, cool. If you walk over to Oak Park, they have a garbage bin on every block. You know, mm -hmm. why don't we have one in Austin? 
there are no garbage bins like in Austin, you know, there's, there's very few. And so it's like, okay, cool. There's a whole bunch of pallet wood that I could find like behind Walgreens. And right now we have a partnership with Guerrero's uh, Pallets on Lake Street to guarantee the creation of 77 garbage bins. And we actually hire members of the community and teach them how to make it. So we're thinking about art as workforce development. It is our dream to have garbage bins on every block in the city of Chicago, made by Altspace, made by those members in the community in Austin, because the average income in Austin is a little over $16,000 a household. So it's about reinvesting in who we are and letting art lead the way. The third thing, I know I, I'm so sorry. The third thing, no. uh, <laughs> um, me and Jordan are artists, you know, at the end of the day. So we might lead the, and direct this nonprofit but we were asked to do a, uh, an exhibition at St. Ambrose University. And I know personally, I haven't shown since 2019, since like before the pandemic. Jordan, Jordan is such a community builder. He's such a, like, a, a man of God, a man of faith. He's always just in the community, just talking to people. And so this is our first time kind of working together at St. Ambrose, you know, creating this exhibition, but we're creating it based on the conversations we've been having in Davenport. And what we realized is the same signifiers in Chicago on the west and south sides is the same signifiers in Davenport. And so we've really been using our agency as artists, like, hey, we're going to leave after this exhibition. So it can't just be about us. It can't just be about, you know, oh, look at the cool stuff that we made. It, something's got to live after we leave here. And so we've been for the past couple of months bringing museums and community organizations and kids together to talk about the resources that they can pull for after we leave. And uh, th that is going to be represented within three installations next month. And I'm super excited about that. Congratulations. Is there anything else anyone would like to add I, but while they think about it? I just want to say what John's doing is really a great example as of when we think about reimagining what art looks like of just literally using plywood to create garbage bins are going to help the betterment of our neighborhoods and how we look. I mean, I think that that also speaks to the economic development, right? Of we see art as transformational of just beyond the visual eye. Um, also thinking about how you said you offer people that are just more maybe like um, office assistants or can do that work or not as creative, but still want to contribute. I think that that is also important because being an artist doesn't just mean picking up a paint paintbrush and painting, right? And so I think you really just kind of hit a lot of points that the focus of this conversation was um, geared toward is just thinking about art as more than just uh, paint and paper or pen and paper. Um, but is there anything anyone else would like to add before we conclude tonight's conversation? So we started the conversation uh, a little bit talking about the forum, this iconic structure at 43rd and the Green Line. And, and I have to share my excitement about one slightly longer term project that we're calling the Creative Complex. And so what we're working to do is to take a piece of the forum, the Western slots of the forum, and to create a set of incubation gallery theater spaces that build on the history of the building and join it with technology. So we, we're really trying to live at the intersection of art, history, and technology and use technology in new and interesting ways to tell our stories and to, to provide access and extend boundaries uh, for folks who might not otherwise be, able, be, be a part of the, 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 the storytelling and the story receiving. So very excited about that initiative. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to work with many of you on the call in, in developing that. Yes, I'm so happy we were able to connect all of you all. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for being a part of this month's community conversation. I'm sorry, Chicago Tonight Black Voices, a WTTW News community conversation. Um, so in the chat for folks that are still tuned in, um, we have a short form for you to fill out. Um, and if you click it, then you can submit ideas, stories, topics, and other issues that you think that we should be talking about in our community conversations. Um, and before we part ways, I just want to say thank you all so much for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's community conversation and that you'll tune in to Chicago Tonight Latino Voices and Chicago Tonight Black Voices, which air on our weekends on Saturdays and Sundays at 6 p.m. 
you are able to live stream that on demand on WTTW.com slash news, as well as Facebook and YouTube. Um, and please be sure to join us for our next community conversation, which will be August 30th at 8 p.m. Um, it'll be our Latina Voices community conversation. Thank you all so, so, so much again for joining us. Such a fruitful conversation as we think about what um, the future of art in the city looks like. Um, and like we've all said, it's it, it goes so much more beyond the eye. Um, and so really allowing viewers to think about what that means. I really think that um, tonight's conversation has opened a lot of people's minds. So thank you guys so much. I'm gonna pass it back to Tim. Thank, thank you everyone. And as Angel said, this has been just a great event. Thank you all for joining us today. And to our uh, viewers out there, thank you so much. This was made possible because of you. So we thank you for your support. And with that said, have a good night and take care and see y'all next time. Take care.